Welcome to the Membership Guys podcast. Kick-ass advice and tips for membership site owners. What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 220 of the Membership Guys podcast. I'm your host, Mike Morrison, one half of the Membership Guys. And today, I'm joined by the other half, the one and only Callie Willows. Woohoo! Yeah. I think I've been on the podcast more times this year than in the entire four years previous to that. Yeah, I'm, you're... I'm slowly sneaking my way in. <laughs> you are. You're worming your way in to my podcast. Not content with your own show, you're now taking over... The main show, the main event. <laughs> now you've got to give people what they want. Oh, man, you will keep rubbing it in. There, everyone seems to love Callie on the show. But Callie is here for a very good reason. Because at the time of recording, it is a week, just over a week, since we closed out our very first live event, Retain Live 2019. And what an event it was. It was pretty cool, right? It really was. I I have to say, going into it, I was a little dubious, but I actually loved it. Yeah. And I'm still sad that it's over. Yeah, it's it's insane that it's been a full week uh, since since we did it. We still, I think, both keep waking up thinking, okay, so what do we got to do today yeah. with our <laughs> with our event attendees? Nothing. They've all gone home. So. Callie is joining me for this week and next week. We're going to do a little double header and we're going to talk about Retain Live. We're going to unpack what worked, what didn't, what lessons were learned, what's coming next. And we're going to talk in this week's episode about the the preparation, the build up to the event. And then next week, we're going to walk through the event itself. So, Our hope is that if you are someone who's thinking of running an event, you'll maybe get some insight and some lessons from the process we went through. Or even if you were an attendee at Retain Live, or maybe you saw stuff about it on social, then this is a little glimpse into the behind the scenes of all of that. Because while we're sitting here now very triumphantly celebrating a fantastic event... Two weeks ago... Yeah, it felt very different two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So before it all went down, it, um, it it got a little dicey there. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in this week's episode. So all the way back in episode 185, we actually talked about the very early stages of planning Retain Live. So some of the hurdles we went through with the name of the event, the venue, how we actually validated and came up with the concept. So I guess we can kind of pick up from there. Now, if this is the first time you're hearing of Retain Live, it was a two-day, kind of technically three-day. Two and a half. Two and a half. We we did a, a little thing the night before the, the two big content days. Um, two-day, single-track, live conference here in our hometown, Newcastle, up on Tyne in England. And we had a bunch of fantastic speakers. We had nearly 200 membership site owners from around the world came for uh, for the event from all corners, Russia, America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Australia South Africa, United Arab Emirates. Like they flocked from far and wide. And of course, Europe and England and a couple of locals. Um, so yeah, so it was a big two-day event, lots of speakers, masterminding, networking, all of that good stuff focused on membership site growth. The very, very first event of its nature that we've ran. We've previously done little mastermind days and workshops, but this was a whole other kettle of fish. Totally different ball game. Yeah. So episode 185, if uh, if you haven't heard that, the membershipguys.com slash 185 starts the story. Let's pick up where that left off. Pretty much... I would say for five or six months after um, we'd got the ball rolling, we were focused on just one thing with Retain. Ticket sales. Ticket sales. <laughs> Our favourite thing. Yeah. Um, so that's all. That's pretty much the vast majority of what we did from the beginning of this year all the way through to July, really, wasn't yeah, we it? we closed ticket sales at the end of July, beginning of August, 1st of August, I think it was. Yeah, so... so that the biggest part and we we announced the event 12 months ago the core of what we've been doing is is pushing ticket sales did you enjoy 
selling tickets for this event, Callie? I did not. No. <laughs> so, and you know, there's certain things where it's exciting initially when you're like unveiling the speakers and the agenda and what you've got planned and things. But most of all, it's just really boring. Like, it's boring. We're not salespeople on a day to day basis with the academy. Like our content does the selling for us a lot. Mm. So, but selling... even then, you know, I, I come from a sales background. Yeah. I love sales, but as a product to sell. An event, especially the first time you've done an event where you don't you don't have videos from past events or photographs or you know even little case studies and stories yeah. of of what past attendees have gone on to do. You don't have any of that. You're just selling this this product that people can't touch that they have to wait for like nine or ten months um, to see. And yeah, once you've got all the details out, the announcements of the speakers, the venue, the socials, and all of that you then just end up repeating yourself, don't you? Yeah, and I think it taught me two things. One is just how you can feel like you're just constantly talking about something and still people don't actually realise it's happening. Yeah. Like I've had, uh, I know Janet has mentioned this before, Janet Murray, that, you know, she'll often be talking about events constantly and there's still people who are like, oh, I didn't even know you were running it. Yeah, and, and we've actually, we've seen that in yeah, some comments on social. Wow, exactly. this looked like a great event. I can't believe I didn't know it was happening. And yeah. we're kind of like, which which <laughs> yeah. enormous rock have you been under? Because it's felt to us yeah. like it's all we've talked about. We bored ourselves talking about this event in the lead up to it. Um, so as a, as a product to sell, compared to something like a membership site where there's always something new happening, there's always new content, there's always members doing great things in the community that you can go and talk about, this, by comparison, once you get past any announcements, it was a boring product to sell. There's, there's not the sort of freshness and and new angles to to use when talking about it as there is with a something like a membership site. So we got kind of we we were pretty bored and that was a big part of our decision to close sales of tickets. Um it was about yeah, it was six weeks, five weeks before the event itself. It was actually eight weeks. Eight weeks. Yeah. yeah essentially. And yeah, it was very definitely a decision that we made on the basis of we wanted to to move it into focusing entirely on how we were going to be running the event, our talks, making sure everything ran smoothly, yeah. and also still pushing tickets at that time was going to be annoying and yeah. time-consuming. And also, we wanted to have a good idea of the numbers because mm. we wanted to do things like get swag, get printing and stuff like yeah. that. And so we wanted to have a clear idea of the numbers. So whilst a lot of people do sell tickets right up to the kind of day before the event, that just wasn't an approach that was going to work for us. No, no. As as Kelly said, part of it was because we were sick of, of of saying the same things over and over again and just trying to keep convincing people. Um, and so we were bored by it. But the clarity that comes from being able to say, okay, ticket sales are closed, so now we know that we don't always have that over our shoulders because we, we smashed our target for attendees. We deliberately set out to make this uh, a smaller, more intimate event compared to some of the, the bigger conferences that you go to. We had a number in mind where we wanted to strike that balance between there being enough people there for you to network and, and meet new people, but a small enough number so that the conversations you had were more meaningful, that they were a little bit longer, that you you know, you you weren't kind of picking faces out of a crowd of thousands. So we we hit that target and we hit it relatively um I would say early on. It wasn't so much early on, but we hit it with time to spare before we closed tickets. But the room we were in, we could have kept pushing for more and more yeah. and more. We weren't limited by the room. The room could have held we could have held double if we changed minimum the layout. Minimum of double. Actually, if we changed the layout, we're closer to triple maybe if we really packed people in um, and if we got a smaller stage. But yeah, we we could have kept going, but the clarity and the breathing room and the ability to switch gears to focusing on developing and designing and and planning what happens on the on the days um i think that was that was a real good decision a couple of people questioned it and a couple of people said well you know you kind of just keep keep it open quietly but no we liked being able to say right this is exactly how many people we're working with so we know how many programs to order how many we could get our name badges ordered with time to spare we could plan the room layout 
more accurately. So yeah. that was good. And yeah, it was it was good to kind of get rid of that boredom yeah. <laughs> from selling tickets. And the other good thing was that we knew there would be people who actually ended up not being able to attend. So it also meant that it was easier for them to sell their tickets if they needed to, because yeah. it wasn't a case of where well, you can buy this person's ticket or buy direct from us. Yeah, they weren't competing with us because it always happens. I've, well, we've got a lot of friends who run events and they prepared us for the reality that there'll be a, a good proportion of your attendees who will drop out um, and also who will just not show up. So having that that two months in which people who, who had since found out they couldn't come could then go off and sell their tickets without them essentially competing with us, it actually made it possible for us to then help those people. Yeah. Yeah, so we actually did that quite a few. And because of that... I think all but maybe one or two people who were selling their ticket because they couldn't make it ended up yeah. being able to sell it on to somebody else. So in terms of actual dropouts prior to the event, um, I think we probably, as a as a percentage, had far fewer than than many other events uh, that we've gone to, and certainly, you know, people whose events where we've spoken to the organisers. So um, yeah, that have, ending those those sales early helped us out there. Um, also, a part of the reason why we uh, we chose the day for when we had the sales is because we went off on holiday at the beginning of August. Yeah, that was not the best idea. No, but I do want to clarify that. We we did go away, but the reason we went then was because it was for a specific event where the timing was fixed. So that was why we went away then, yeah. as opposed to it just being that we decided that, oh, yeah, it's a good idea yeah. to go. We, we didn't just kind of think, you know what, we've had enough of all of this event nonsense. We need a holiday. It was something that, like, there was no other time we could have gone to this event, and um, it, the event was abroad. So that, that was an interesting little wrinkle, but it did... We did a lot of work while we were there. We like, did. We, there was a lot of traveling. So we both kind of, I worked on the plane. We both worked on the train. We did some work on our talks in the hotel. You did some design work. So we did yeah. We did work on stuff like while I, we were away I created well. the whole opening video for the event on a, a train ride from Montreal to Toronto. Yeah. So, you know, whereas otherwise that might, maybe wouldn't have got done. Yeah, I do actually think it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. We probably couldn't relax as much because mm. we were still doing stuff. So it wasn't exactly the best of both worlds in yeah. terms of relaxing holiday stroke working holiday. But we, I, I don't think it was a majorly bad idea. It, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't a major bad idea. What it did do, though, is it affected other people we were working yeah. with. Because even though we said to, to people, so we worked with an event management team and an AV team for the staging and the audio and the video. We've obviously got people on, on our team with the membership guys. What this did is even though we were saying, listen, we're on holiday, but we're, we're not really on holiday. We're going to be answering emails. We're, we're doing bits and pieces on this project uh, while we're away. So if something needs doing, email us like act as though we're not on holiday but i think there's a there's a thing in certain people where even if you say to them listen we might be on holiday but we're still answering emails they don't want to inconvenience you so there were quite a few things where we yeah. know that other people we were working with just like left those things until after we got back on holiday and and we did that with some things as well there was a few things where we said okay well there's no point getting into this before we go away so let's just sh let's just push it down the road till afterwards yeah. so it, it gives you that it gives you that kind of um I'm, I'm not sure what the word is for it but that almost milestone that makes it easy to to schedule things in later and defer stuff yeah that otherwise maybe if you just got it done there and then you would have you would have moved a little quicker on some things. Yeah, and I think the thing it did do was it meant that as soon as we got back, it was all hands on deck the mm. next three weeks because we got back three weeks before the event. And so those three weeks were then just hardcore, everything about the event, you know, working on our talks, working on all of the design and print and everything, all yeah. the logistics. So kind of since since we got back from that trip, it's all been about retain yeah and that's the thing you know even though obviously going away and not being able 100 focus um might seem like a bad thing and even in our notes where we're talking about what we're discussing on the thing we've got holiday bad idea but you know what even just taking a few days even if we weren't away taking a few days to just check out a little bit 
to give yourself a little breathing space so that then you can come back to it and switch gears more purposefully. I think that that buffer between the stuff you were doing before you get into event mode and getting into event mode, I think was helpful. Because yeah. like you say, it meant we could come back and we knew that as soon as we got back, it was all about retain. And I think that that made it easier for us to mentally prepare ourselves for that. Yeah. Now, sorry. So I was going to say, and, and that knowing that that date that we were going away was there, then that meant that things like batching content, everything we wouldn't be able to do for while we were actually heads down in mm-hmm. full on event mode, that gave us a deadline for, okay, we need to have all of this done, sorted yeah. by this date so that we can go away. And then when we come back, it's all about the event. Yeah. So, you know, all of our podcast episodes, we batched months worth so that we didn't have to worry about it academy content was batched our team were all prepped that you know okay between this date and this date we're still going to be in the academy and obviously i think for members they wouldn't have noticed any difference but you know during these these times we need you to be a little more attentive in the community we need you to be the first responder on customer service all that sort of stuff so yeah having having that specific date made that a little easier there were little things like it, the logistics of um sponsors sending you stuff for the yeah. swag bags it did mean we we had to say to them do not send us anything between these dates and unfortunately one did do you remember yeah and it was it happened to be like five big boxes of power banks that for some inexplicable reason the delivery company decided to just leave outside in the rain and fortunately a very for three days for three days fortunately a very kind neighbor um who noticed who, who <laughs> noticed and and um you know happened to have space in his garage um came in and he and these were heavy boxes as they well were, yeah. and he took all five of these boxes well, through there was more because other deliveries more. had come by then as well oh, yeah. which was the thing that surprised me it's like but you've seen that these boxes are out here they've clearly not been collected and it's been at least a day and yeah. you're just adding more boxes to the top of them yeah so that so again little wrinkles like that um yeah but everything worked out all right there was no damage to any of those things so yeah it was heads down as soon as we got back from that holiday and we had a lot of work so there's like again i mentioned we know a lot of people run events they warned us that there's a lot of work they didn't quite prepare us i don't think they warned us strongly enough (laughs) yeah but i think part of that is we were doing even though we had an event team we were doing a lot of it ourselves yeah still So the event team that we hired, you know, they are specifically an event management company and we originally approached them for on-the-day support. So we kind of thought, we'll just organize everything, we'll take care of everything in the build-up, but we need to have just one or two people around uh, in addition to our staff members. um, We need one or two people around who can talk the language of the AV company and and the hotel so they can be a port of call if something goes wrong because we knew if we're up on stage and the av busts we can't be shouting instructions out we can't be running around somebody needs to be in control of this so we approached our event team with that in mind but actually just from that first conversation with them we we quickly figured out you know what we should have them involved in in the build-up so they helped with things like organizing the the social event um setting all of that up um in in booking things like the the speakers dinner because we like to treat our speakers well so we knew we wanted to take them out for a nice slap up meal before the event started to get everyone um acquainted with each other and get everyone excited about being part of the event um getting quotes and things for branding and signage yeah so certain signage so obviously our background means that a lot of the design work and a lot of the a lot of the little bits and pieces for like the swag bags and the badges and stuff um we were designing in-house some stuff i did myself some stuff our designer claire helped out with claire put together a phenomenal um program for the event which was just awesome um beautiful yeah it was a great great program so a lot of stuff we did in-house but then there's things like i've literally never designed before which is like that the large kind of signage um and the tall boys and the larger format stuff and like vinyl stickers for the windows and stuff um i can i can source printers for the smaller stuff that we used to that we used to do for clients and for ourselves but 
I don't really know where to start for the large format stuff. So again, this is where the event team came in really handy. So having having never done this before, being able to call upon a company who does this like two or three times a week uh, was was invaluable. It probably saved us a lot of research time, a lot of hassle, a lot of headaches. Um, it was a little challenging at times. I was going to say, but it did make me realize how much of a... I'm control not, freak. Yeah, control freak. <laughs> I am, and how how much I like to know what's going on. Yeah. Like, I, I, I'm not somebody who can just sit back and let somebody else do everything without knowing what's happening. I like to to know yeah. at least what's going on and what's what's being dealt and with. The, and the bad thing is, now that wouldn't be so bad if I was the opposite side of the coin. But you're just as bad. I'm just I'm just <laughs> as bad, worse. and I am worse in in certain for certain things. I'm I'm a lot worse. Um, so that that made it a little challenging because obviously companies like this, most of the time, they are hired by people who just want to wash their hands of it, hand the entire thing over to the event team, and let them do everything. But we had. We're not those people. We're not those people. <laughs> we had several instances where we get an email from Sophie on the event team saying, okay, I was thinking we could do this or we could do that. And we'd be like, we've already done it. We've designed it. We've got the, we've got the package here. It's already taken care of. Like, But we hadn't told her in advance we're going to do that. We hadn't discussed it that we're going to do it. So... Yeah, I'm not sure whether they love us or hate us. That's the honest. thing. I think they kind of love us because we. it, it must make their job a little bit easier and they actually said, I don't think I've ever worked with a client who's as on top of everything. Um, they said this when we very first went to them, like yeah. to, to talk to them. We're like, I don't think we've ever had someone who's so well organized, especially for a first event, um, before they even got involved. But it definitely, it definitely, as I said, exposed that where definitely bigger control freaks than me were realized. Some of that is because, you know, we were very fortunate in the business that we have that there's not that much of what we do that is heavily dependent on input from other people. We we run a fairly low pressure, low stress ship. We we yeah. we batch content so far in advance that there's rarely ever any need for like grinding towards a deadline. Um yeah, so that was it was a change of pace for us. It was a little bit of a learning curve. And but that, it worked, I think. Yeah, and I think add into that an element of we really wanted this to be an awesome event. We, yeah. we cared about the little details and making sure that everything went, went without a hitch and stuff. So mm. that, I think, also compounded on us. Just It was our baby, essentially, for the yeah. last year. And we wanted to make sure that it, it came out how we wanted it to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, I, I think there's, without question, there's areas of the event that we massively overthought yeah. and over planned and over prepared for but it paid off it paid off because without skipping too far ahead a lot of people during the event were saying just and these are people who run events themselves uh, remarked on the fact that every every little thing was taken care of every everything ran like clockwork every yeah. it seemed like we thought of everything and actually the reason for that is we had, <laughs> we had yeah. thought of everything. Um, and I think part of that as well, what, it's really handy that we've both been to a lot of events so mm -hmm. we can draw a lot on on what we've found worked at other events, what didn't work at other events. Yeah. And and kind of like a few people asked me how we, how we put together what we did and stuff. And I was quite honest and said, you know, we basically thought what event would we want to go to? Exactly, what exactly. What would we want? And that's what we delivered. Yeah, and having been to a lot of events and, and you know, when we decided we were doing this, we made a point of making sure when we went to events that we we had our event organizer brain on um and we 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 got a ticket for for example social media marketing world we had no intention of going to that event this year we've been a few times before we had no real intention of going to that event this year but we happened to be in the states at the time and we thought you know what we're going to buy a ticket but this time we're going to pay close attention to the actual running of the event. Yeah. And we're going to think about what works for us, what did we like, what didn't we like. Um, I'm not not throwing any shade at social media marketing world. It's a phenomenal production and I've got unprecedented levels of respect for how much goes into it. But one little thing, the swag bags. Social media marketing world have a swag bag. They don't. Well, that's the thing. They have a bag 
but with nothing no, in it. With nothing in it, with no swag. So that actually, that's always, that's been my long running thing of it's a swag bag with no swag. Um, so little things like that, like in the grand scheme of things for that event, it's nothing. But it's just that little thing where we can look at that and say, okay, so that stood out to us as something we don't want with our event. So what do we want? And that led to us obviously thinking more about the swag bag and stuff like that. Whereas maybe without that, without that counterpoint of seeing what what didn't hit the mark for us as attendees, um, we maybe wouldn't have had reason to think about what would have hit the mark for us as attendees. Um, but again, some of the things social media marketing world, certain things like their networking bingo, we adapted that idea into something I brilliantly called Retango, which... Stop trying to make Retango happen. <laughs> it turned into a little running joke throughout the event of how how terrible a pun and how desperately I was trying to make Retango this thing. It turned into a real a real good little running joke with attendees, how excited I was over this thing. And, you know, we events like Youpreneur Summit, um, events like Content Marketing Academy Live, there were little and marketed live, little bits and pieces, things that we liked, we didn't like, worked and didn't work, that we maybe wouldn't even have cause to think about if we hadn't been to all those events. So I would say anyone who's thinking of running events, start going to events. Yeah. Think about the the attendee experience, what you like, what you didn't like, and why, and then use that as inspiration for for your own stuff. So yeah, like that that fed into obviously what what we would say was overthinking, but that's because we had a lot of different. Uh, we were more aware of the sorts of things uh, to think about. There were certain things again when we talk about the event management team, the AV company who were phenomenal. Um, but very laid back. Very laid back. So, uh, so you know, it's one of those things where obviously if they're doing this all the time, they know that they don't really need to actually start planning certain things yeah. until a certain date and stuff. But we didn't know that. So yeah. we were maybe like... <laughs> or, or even when they told us, we would go we would go back. So we'd say to them, okay, so when when's the best time to get the slides to you? When, when should we put together a running order? And they were very, very chill about it and saying, oh, listen, you don't need to worry about that until you know, the week or two before, and then we'll have a conversation. But we'd go back to the office and say, well, that can't be right. Yeah. That can't yeah. be right. And so let's let's really overthink about it. Yeah, and I don't think any of the people we've worked with in this event uh, have probably had anybody so eager to pay them before. Because mm-hmm. the amount of times we've been like, can you send us an invoice? Can we pay like, you? Immediately. <laughs> can we pay you immediately? Because, again... The little overthinking is if we don't pay, if, if we don't lock this down, we don't have a signed contract and a paid invoice now, then what happens if someone better comes along like tomorrow yeah. and we lose our AV company? Yeah. So, you know. Even the hotel where I'm like, can you can you send me the invoice yeah. for the rest of the money so we can yeah. get that sorted and out <laughs> so, the way? And, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I, I think that I would much rather overthink than underthink. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it, it, it definitely, definitely paid off. But, and, you know, there's a lot of things that you don't know that you don't know. Things like the running order. We wouldn't have been, we wouldn't have even thought about there being kind of like this document that essentially plans out the entire day, minute to minute of behind the scenes stuff. We wouldn't have thought about that until we went to Youpreneur Summit at Chris Chris Ducker's event in November. And we actually caught a glimpse of theirs. And we saw little things like, you know, 2.45, 2.45, make sure that Chris has a, a cup of the throat remedy available for him in this place at that time. Like, we hadn't thought of that level of that level of preparedness um, and, and detail. But, yeah, that that's it's, it's necessary and that's something that we kind of painstakingly put together. Again, as opposed to just letting our event management team do it, we were like, no, no, we're, we're going to map out the two days. We're going to give instructions to everyone. It was a little weird writing in instructions like um, order a taxi for Mike and Callie because you feel so lazy. Like putting instructions for your your um, event team, like get some food from from the buffet for Mike and Callie ready at, for this time when they come off stage. But you you have to really, don't you? Because you, you don't realise how little you are able to control proceedings on the day. And we'll not go too much into the on the day stuff now. But thinking ahead of stuff like that and realizing that you're not going to be able to handle anything on the logistics on the day. So you, 
you know, things like making sure if you've got speakers that there is someone going to the speaker 15 minutes before their session, taking them to the AV desk, getting them mic'd up, having them ready in a certain area of the room. You need to, like, thinking through what needs to happen at what time makes it a much more intricate um, planning experience than I think we'd been prepared for until we actually got stuck into this. Yeah, and I think it's worth noting here as well, we weren't just hosting the event. We were both speaking multiple times throughout Mm. each day. So as well as doing the usual hosting duties, we were doing a keynote together. We both had two talks each day. We were both doing panel discussions as well. So we were on stage a lot doing sessions, not just kind of in the background watching speakers do their thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, We had considered getting an MC, so getting someone to host the event but so much of of our brand is built around us the membership guys and it just it just didn't feel right and we spoke to a few people about it yeah. should we get an mc should it be us and everyone agreed it should be us so that's something we'd also underestimated because obviously we wrote that opening keynote which was nearly an hour long two short sessions of so the quick win sessions each You hosted two panels. I hosted one extended panel, but we didn't think about the in-between stuff. Or, sorry, we thought about we didn't realize quite how much the in-between stuff would be. The introducing each speaker, wrapping up after the speaker's gone off the stage. Or, like, we had a few little surprise moments, a few little things we did on stage, which we'll talk about in the next episode. But writing notes and scripts for those, um, all those little transitions welcoming people to the event, finishing out each day and telling them what happens next. All of that stuff, we underestimated how much work that would be. So we kind of left that till last. And I think I ended up spending two to three days writing that. Yeah, you were writing that solid. And I'll admit this here. I don't think I admitted this to you at the time because you were a little bit stressed. (laughs) Um, But I thought you were a bit nuts doing that. I was kind of like, we can just stand up and make it up as we go. Yeah, we'll just wing it. Apart from introducing the speakers, Mm. I was kind of like, well, surely you can just wing that in-between stuff. Forgetting, though, that I'm not very good at winging stuff. (laughs) So actually, even though, you know, we had the prompt cards, we had the, the kind of scripts, and initially I was sticking to that. But once I got into my groove, I, d- I went off script quite a bit. Yeah. But it was definitely good to have those there yeah. to make sure there wasn't any kind of brain emptying moments yeah. and, and just sort of like, what am I supposed to be doing yeah, now? What am I supposed to be saying? That was the thing because it was such a tight, it was such a tight, not tight schedule in terms of everything that would be to the minute, but we were actually packing, we were packing in a lot. lot. <laughs> we were packing in a lot. And so actually having the words on paper. Some of it was just for reference to remind us where it was. Some things, it was important that we got the wording right. Um, So yeah, that took a lot longer to write than we thought. And then like the night before this all kicked off, we were up till 3 a.m. cutting and pasting those those lines for all the in-between bits onto cards so we we had like the the branded backed cards like game show presenters have just so we didn't have to carry around big scripts every day so we had to cut up essentially the the script for the emceeing and stick them on those cards and that took forever like three in the morning like considering that 24 hours later we're up on stage in our finery as these you know Look at these big rock star on a pedestal stuff. But that night, before it all kicked off, well, I got scraps of paper just randomly stuck to various body <laughs> parts, like Pritt sticks. I don't know that Pritt stick in the US. It's kind of like crazy glue on a stick kind of thing. Like that was just all over the place. It was not glamorous. It was not rock star. It was, yeah. <laughs> it was, it was a little, a little nuts. Yeah. But that. That was a stressful couple of weeks. Yeah, I don't think we really slept. Well, I didn't sleep very much in the the couple of weeks in the build up to the event. Anyway, I was definitely yeah. exhausted by the time we got round to it. Yeah, it was it was a hard hard couple of weeks. Um, we a lot of things came together perfectly at yeah. the right time. I think I think ordering things for swag bags and the sponsor gear and all yeah. all of those things where we had so many different like so many different little bits of design so many so many things to go into the swag bags um like branded stickers notebooks 
pop grips for mobile phones. Um, God, what else? Yeah, we had we had a lot, but it was quite good because, yeah, all the stuff that we had ordered and that was printed and stuff like that, all of that had arrived before the week before the event. Yeah. So the last week in the run-up to the event was mainly about us practicing our talks, getting all those final last yeah. things in place, rather than worrying about stuff arriving, which I'm yeah. glad we did. Yeah, I'm glad we did. And, yeah, we are very much of the mindset of I'd rather have stuff three weeks before we need it and have the inconvenience of it kind of like taking up room in our hallway and stuff like that than leave it till the last minute and everything go wrong. Um, so in some regards, a lot of things came together exactly at the right time for us. Some of the things that we thought would have been squared away before that last week or two um, weren't quite as tidy. Uh, speakers, for example, we had some fantastic, fantastic speakers, but I've got to say it was interesting being on the other side of the equation in dealing with speakers in terms of getting in slides and in terms of making sure everyone has all the information that they need and all that sort of stuff. I'm realizing I must be teacher's pet yeah. <laughs> when I speak at events because generally you'll get given a deadline for slides and I like I'm always in by that deadline, like well in advance of it. And I just assumed everybody else's as well. Uh, I learned that's not the case <laughs> with this event. I learned that it's it's definitely um, more of a rarity to to have all the slides and all the information stuff from speakers on the day of the deadline. Uh, in fact, I want to give a big shout out for Diana Tower. This was the first speaking gig of this sort of size that Diana's done. She sent in her slides at about 11 p.m. on the deadline we gave speakers with a huge apology for the fact that they were coming in late and that she really wanted to get them to me before 5 p.m. that day, before close of business. And she's so sorry if this has caused a problem, you know, and this was going on, that was going on. And I had to reply and say, Diana... <laughs> You're literally the first person to send us your slides. So thank you. Um, so it was it was interesting being on the other side of things. But, you know, actually a, a whole bunch of speakers who knew they wouldn't hit that deadline told us in advance. You have to compromise um, and remember that when you're dealing with pro speakers, speakers who speak at a lot of events, and especially when, if you do what we did, and you ask them, pretty much all of them, bar one, to write a brand new talk just for this event, um, you have to kind of cut people a little bit of slack. But it was definitely definitely interesting to be on the other side of things. We didn't have any major issues. Um, we did have one slide deck come in in the wrong format, but actually I think one out of one out of ten um wasn't wasn't yeah. too bad and i think it was more just because as we've already said you know we're the kind of people that are organized in advance and stuff so having one two speakers who left it till the night before the event to get yeah. their slides in and we're still changing things was a little bit stressful for us because that meant we couldn't see them in advance yeah. either we we you know the whole reason you ask for slides in advance is so you can actually check and make sure it's going to be right for your audience and things like that and we couldn't do we that couldn't do that and also you know we tried to we tried to incorporate a lot of the things we knew our speakers would be talking about. We tried to sow the seeds for them into our talks yeah. because, um, especially for the opening one, like if we're obviously talking about something, we only have 45 minutes, right? So we can't dig into all the solutions and all the different offshoots that there might be from our talk. But it was a good way for us to be able to say, like, for example, if we if we mentioned content repurposing, which we did briefly in one segment of our talk, it was beneficial for us to be able to say, and we're going to have the fantastic Amy Woods from content10x.com. She'll be up on stage later today to talk all about that. But obviously, we couldn't do that with uh, some of the speakers where it literally came in at like the the latest possible moment but you know what i actually um like as i say there were some speakers who yeah they didn't get them in on the day we wanted the slides in but we deliberately set that deadline a little earlier to allow for that but they sent them the week after yeah um there were three or four who pretty much as soon as we sent it out came back and says you know we just gotta let you know I'm at another event that week, um, and then this is happening, so I definitely won't be able to get them in on that day, but I'll get them in by this point. Is that okay? Um, so they took, like we knew with with most of them, if we weren't getting them on the day, we would eventually get them, and we made sure that we that we were clear in our communications with speakers at all times to avoid any anything like that 
escaping our notice. Um, but yeah, I think of the two that came in kind of right at the 11th hour, there was only one of them where we didn't already know it was going to be late. Yeah. Um, and I think it's it's a good batting average, to be honest. But it's definitely it's definitely more stressful doing an event with multiple speakers than when it is just yeah. you. Because okay. you forget there's so many things that you like. You're doing a speaker's dinner. You need their menu choices. So you've got 10 people to to wrangle for that. Booking their accommodation, we pay for their hotel rooms and stuff like that. Again, confirming what day you're going to come in, what day you want to leave, do you need extra, anything like that. Do you want to bring, are you bringing a member of your team? It can be a bit like herding cats. Um, and so as we were in that last week or so before the event, still having some of these things not nailed down in in the way that we thought it would definitely add it to that stress because that that final week was all stress yeah definitely i don't i don't think i felt that anxious and stressed in in years if yeah. i'm honest i'm tired yeah i i'm one of those people where i'm not a great sleeper anyway but as soon as i get anxious or stressed my sleep gets affected add to that that we did have a ton of work to do mm -hmm. and i just yeah barely slept which obviously doesn't help and yeah i, I was i was the same i was the same we honestly we were we were of the mindset that listen, we just need to get this over and done with. Yeah, if you'd have asked us two two weeks ago if we were going to do this event again or anything similar, it would have been a flat out no, no, no question, <laughs> no way. We were we were we were burned out. We, we really, really were. we really 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 were. And you know, added to the fact that uh, we talked about the 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 lead into this for several months, where we're just kind of ugh, it's just the boring process of trying to sell tickets so that had taken a lot of the shine off the apple in terms of oh this we've got this exciting event we were bored we were bored of hearing retain we were bored of typing retain like we were bored of it already and then the ramping up of those stress levels the the loss of sleep the increased anxiety from being control freaks overthinking everything the unforeseen um little things that still weren't quite squared away with speakers and bits and bobs like that. We we had burnout, I would say, a week and a half before, and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse in in the lead up, like in that final week. And yeah, we we just wanted to get this out of the way. We kept consoling ourselves and saying, listen, it'll it'll be good, but we just go just in one in one week's time it'll all be behind us and we never have to think about it again like it'll all be all right it'll all be good but let's just get it done let's get out of the way um and then we never have to do this ever again we don't have to think about it we just wanted it done so yeah that's that's where we get to got to and i think that was that burnout and that kind of i think almost negative place we got into about the event definitely wasn't helped with um obviously being close at the event seeing more dropouts yeah. and getting more emails from people saying yeah we can't make it um honestly i think some of that we knew there'd be dropouts in advance and as we said we were able to we were able to help people sell their tickets on which i think buoyed us a little bit because it's like okay well that's one fewer bum on seat but actually two days later someone else has got their ticket and they're now excited about coming but some of the, I think the ones that got us down were were the ones where it was kind of like, oh, hey, I've got my ticket for the event. Um, I, I'm not going to be able to come. Uh, I've decided I'm doing something else. And it was... Yeah, or not even that, just I've decided it's not a priority. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to come. And then this was kind of like a few days before the event. So there wasn't really time to, to get sells. a replacement for yeah. the ticket and stuff. So, and then... Yeah, quite a lot of people who just, I suppose we'll talk about that yeah. in the event stuff, but quite a few people who just didn't show up and never said anything. Yeah, So, but I think in the week beforehand, I think in particular there were one or two, you know, dropouts are dropouts. We had some people who sold their tickets on because one in particular, they just, um, they'd been approved to adopt That two, was a couple of months in advance. That was a couple advance, of months though. in advance, um, but it was someone uh, who, along with their wife, were were approved to adopt it was two kids wasn't two there little girls, two yeah. little girls and and we're kind of like listen <laughs> don't worry about retain seriously screw retain this is more important 
Because obviously it is, right? Yeah. Um, so at no point do we ever feel any kind of negativity. There was a little bit of, oh, it's a shame that they're not able to come, but I wouldn't come either in yeah. those circumstances. But then, you know, we had people, one or two, um, in those days beforehand where we were, we were already feeling a bit down. We'd say they'd either send an email or they'd just make a a comment on a on someone else's Facebook post, so they wouldn't actually they didn't actually yeah, say yeah they to never us. actually said anything yeah. to us. It was just a, oh I'm not going to go anymore yeah. either. And and some of these were people who actually we'd have long standing relationships with, and we'd always considered to kind of be um, one of our people, you know, and and because we were already feeling a little vulnerable, taking it too far, but we were already feeling a bit down yeah. about the event anyway just because of how much we were getting stressed and burned yeah. out that mm-hmm. actually seeing seeing some people who we felt were like our our bigger fans our bigger supporters showing uh, apathy yeah they were ambivalent about coming. yeah the, the total ambivalence about coming definitely made us kind of think well hold on why are we doing this why are we doing this because and what are we walking into? Because if the people we thought were our biggest kind of cheerleaders are so ambivalent, so apathetic, so underwhelmed by the prospect of coming to the event, what are we walking into? Because not everyone at the event is going to be a big Mike and Cali fan. A lot of people are coming who who were new to our audience. So if our most passionate audience members were just kind of like, man, I'm just not going to go – why were we doing it and what were we letting ourselves in for? That's that, that's where our mindset was. Yeah, I was gonna in say that, that makes week. it sound way more dramatic and negative mm. than it actually was, because it was a handful of people. But yeah. that's that's how it was in our brain at the time, mine especially. Like I think you took it a lot more on your chin than me, but I think mm. A, because I was dealing with a lot of well, I was dealing with the attendee stuff more than yeah, you. But so also there was more. there was a, a degree to which I had to uh, I had to balance it out. Yeah. <laughs> by kind of because actually because we have a thing if you're upset or annoyed about something and I'm not, generally you come back from that quick and vice versa. Yeah, but if we're both in the in the mud on something, it takes a lot longer. It takes a bit longer because you don't have that you don't have the support of the other person to yeah. kind of snap you out of it. So that seeing stuff like that and one one or two in particular where they were just kind of like yeah, you know what? I was going to come, but uh, there's this other thing happening. I'm just going to go to that now. Like that really bummed me out. But I had to kind of, I had to ignore it. And it was easy. It was easy to ignore it when we had so much other stuff. But yeah, that that didn't help with our mindset as we as we came into that final weekend before return. And I think the final blow was British Airways <laughs> um, striking on the day that most of our international. Yeah. People were flying, so a lot of our attendees had their flights cancelled or rearranged, and that was really stressful. Unfortunately, 90% of them managed to, to rebook, uh, but we did lose a few people because of that as well, yeah. because they just couldn't reorganise the flights to work. Yeah, and you know, neither of us are religious, um, we'll openly say that, but if you're a little more spiritual than I'm, I am... I'm more spiritual yeah, and woo-woo. Yeah, but you know, if, if at any point I was going to look at this and kind of say there's a higher power at work here and they are working against this event then when we saw that announcement from british airways that they were striking it was the monday before our event yeah, the wasn't day it most people were flying the day in. everyone was traveling in yeah. that that when you consider we had issues with like going all the way back to the stuff we talked about back in episode 185 the issues with the name, the issues with the venue that we had at the beginning. And then now as we move in closer to it, you've got travel issues and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, because then the trains went on strike Then the trains, well. the trains went on strike. <laughs> like if there was a higher power conspiring to stop us doing this event, like I was I was pretty much convinced that that, <laughs> that was what was going on. And when we're already feeling like, wow, why are we doing this? To have this sort of cosmic kick in the guts as well to say yeah why are you doing this um definitely again like we said put us in put us in a place we're not accustomed to being because yeah. um everything about our business really day to day is generally pretty awesome yeah because uh, you know we work hard to not have to work that hard yeah to be honest like we, <laughs> we you know with the academy we, with we everything work, we we work hard 
to create a business and a life that makes it feel like we're not working hard. Yeah, yeah, that's a better way that's of putting it. That's a good it. way of putting it. Like, until this year, we're very much about having an easy life, a comfortable life. We love what we do yeah. and we enjoy doing it on our own terms. And this year has been very much outside of our comfort zone and nothing more so than running this event, I think. And I think for both of us, because it was so far outside of both of our comfort zones, mm-hmm. mine in particular, because a big part of my stress and anxiety was the speaking. Because whilst Mike speaks all over the world and you know he's a pro speaker, I'm not. I've never been on a stage before and, and done that mm-hmm. kind of speaking. So for me, that was a huge anxiety provoking thing as it well. Was. And and for me as well, in knowing that it was stressful for you because my process for practicing talks, preparing talks, isn't a one that's a particularly friendly process for someone who, (laughs) where this isn't their comfort zone, because it's, I mean, you've seen me prep for talks. It's it's grueling. Um, And so it was a whole, it was a new kettle of fish for me. And I'm not only worrying about what I'm saying, but also making sure that you're you're becoming more and more at ease with it. Um, and you know, it was it was as we were getting closer and closer to the event. I actually think the fact we were doing this together for the first time is the first time we've done that double act, which definitely makes it more challenging. Um, we, I think, we found our groove. We did really quicker than I would expect, and that actually I think led to me being a little more relaxed. With my preparation, yeah. which I think in turn helped you, maybe because you know I wasn't uh, I wasn't as intensely scrutinizing everything yeah. because we we found a real good relaxed. Group yeah, I think we speaking. found a way to work it well, and, and yeah. a lot of people liked the double act and said it worked well. So yeah. it was always going to be difficult because you know you are in the nicest possible way, kind of you're used to having the stage to yourself and oh, things. Absolutely. So actually, for me, it was a concern of actually how how much is he going to be able to to hand over to me a yeah. little bit and things. Yeah. But I think it actually worked really it worked well. well. It worked to both our strengths. Yeah, definitely. And we'll talk a little bit more about that opening keynote tomorrow. But this, again, is all say all of this is happening in kind of the seven to ten days and it's ra- before the event and it's ramping up and ramping up and ramping up. So, as we said before, as we entered that that final weekend and and kind of coming into that, that Monday, which was the day before um, our setup day and our prep day, we were ready to get this done. We were looking forward to the Friday when everyone would be gone, when this would be behind us, and we could move on and never have to worry about this and never have to do this again. So that's where we're going to leave things. We're going to leave things in the dark place, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> and we've already said at the top of the show, it it, it got better, right? Yeah. And if you follow us on social media, you then know you it will got better. know that it, it got yeah, better. Yeah, it got better. Um, but... I don't think we perhaps let on in the build-up to it and we were sharing stuff on social as we were preparing. I don't think we quite let on just how stressed, how burned out we were with the whole process. And this wasn't because we were just doing too much or whatever. It was just a a culmination of a whole bunch of things plus how far out of our comfort zone this was and... Other things that, like the BA strike that we had zero control over. So that's where we're going to leave things this week, in that dark place where we're just ready to get this all over and done with. Uh, So before we wrap up today's episode, we just want to quickly run through some of our top lessons from the, the whole prep for this event. I think the first thing that we would say, and we've not talked too much about this in this episode, is it's real important to get clear on the purpose of your event. Yeah, I think one of the reasons for us that it did become difficult is because actually this has never been a money making exercise for us. We weren't planning on making a profit from the event itself. We always knew at best we would make even on things like ticket sales and that sponsors. potentially and sponsors and potentially we would lose money and we were okay with that. Yeah, in fact, but- any time it looked like we were going to make profit. We then looked at okay, so if we're going to make ten grand in profit. Um, then what could we use that money for to make the experience even better for our attendees? Yeah, so we weren't ma- planning on making money from the event itself, and it wasn't an event where we were selling anything either. So it wasn't an event designed to sign people up to a mastermind or a higher product or even to the membership. So this wasn't something we were doing to add money to our bottom line and things like mm. that. And so I think to some extent when we had those thoughts of 
oh, why are just, we doing yeah, this? Yeah, why are we doing this? There was the element of, you know, we're doing all of this as well, and it's, it's not something that is designed to actually even bring us money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, like, when the, when the answer to that question, why are we doing this, is something where it's like, well, we're doing this because we thought it would be fun, <laughs> and then it's not fun, then you start to feel worse, right? Yeah. Why are we doing this? Well, we're doing it because, um, and the real reason is it's, it's marketing, it's branding, it's positioning, yeah. it's content creation, because obviously all the different sessions then become uh, content that we put in the academy. It was also uh, to, to strengthen and foster relationships with our community, which will help with retention. Yeah. Um, you know, we've already seen in the aftermath of the event, people who hadn't been active in the academy community, they're now jumping in there. But yeah. these were all nice-to-haves, and that made, that made it a little more problematic when we were having those questions why yeah. are we doing this we had to make we had to an effort convince to remind ourselves yes. of why it was going to be worth it and you know and it has been worth it as mike said but definitely making sure that you know why you're doing the event what you're hoping to get out of it yeah is is vitally important yeah and and if it is something that is more of a nice to have than a must do it, you know if it's something that you're not doing as a revenue generator then you just have to prepare yourself that you might need to have something in place or have someone to remind you of the the upsides from yeah. doing this. It's, it's a lot clearer if your upside is, okay, well, we're doing this because actually we're going to make $100,000 in, in add-on sales or something like that. That's a much clearer answer to why we're doing this than, you know, someone thought this would be fun to do <laughs> so yeah get clear on the purpose of your event that'll definitely um help you adapt your approach i would also say however much time however many resources energy you think this is going to take double it don't try and kind of squeeze in running an event as as a little side thing it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of energy there'll be so many things that you will take for granted as stuff that maybe you think will just take a, an hour or two. There'll be so many things you will never have thought of until it's it's too late. And so you need to make sure you give yourself the bandwidth and you dedicate the resources and you hire help where you can, specialist help. Yeah. On the day support is essential. Having someone to be your eyes, your ears, your voice in... In, in talking to venues, AV companies, dealing with attendees, you can't be doing that at your event. And even if you're not on stage or doing anything else, you can't do this on your own. So on-the-day support is essential. Quality, like an AV team who know what they're doing, yeah, so and, important. And I'm going to admit again here that when we were sorting the AV and the staging, I thought Mike was being a little bit OTT with what he wanted and how much we were going to be paying and stuff. Um, but I went along with that because that was always something that was more more your area yeah. of expertise than mine. And it was definitely, you know, worth paying that extra for what we got. You know, it was so high quality. So everything from the staging to the team themselves to how professional everything was on the day, how everything ran to time. Yeah. You know, the amount of people, especially all, we had a lot of musicians in the room and the amount of them that came up to me and said, your AV team are amazing because they yeah. were all watching like the AV and the sound and stuff. Um, and other speakers, know, speakers who who spoken at massive events or around the events. world or run events themselves were commenting on how great the AV was. And it just meant that there were no headaches, there were no blips. And if there were, actually I'm saying that, there might have been. Yeah, we just didn't know about it. We just don't know about Which it because <laughs> they were they were so, so good. Yeah. So it is worth paying for quality yeah. AV. Most of the most of the bad experiences I've heard people talk about, speakers talk about at events stem from bad AV. Um so yeah, really worth paying for. Uh we mentioned during the episode, overthinking things isn't necessarily bad. It's better than underthinking. I'm, I'm convinced that the reason so many people complimented us yeah. on the fact that it felt like everything had been taken care of was because we'd overthought literally everything. So it's better than underthinking, but make sure you give yourself a sanity check every now and then because you can go a bit too far. I was ordering unnecessary things on Amazon at one in the morning like <laughs> for that, that our event team had already taken care of, but I was just... Again, massively overthinking. Oh, damn! We're going to need we're going to need like 
display stands for the for the attendee badges. So I just go on Amazon and order them at one in the morning. Of course, I didn't need to be doing that. So, yeah. Yeah. And something else I quite want to add is actually part of the reason that we did have so much stress and something to do and stuff to do was we also had a couple of secret projects that we were working on to unveil at the event, which were taking time as well. So we'll talk about that in the next episode. But it's worth noting as well that if we were just doing the event stuff, it still would have been stressful and things like that, but probably not quite as stressful. But we decided to add to our plate in terms of yes. e- extra things that we were doing and time that was needed. Yeah, definitely. And again, if you follow us on social, you'll already know what one of those things uh, is. And that was all part of us really wanting this to be a memorable experience. Yeah. Um, but even without that, like yeah. actually you balance that up. One of those secret projects kind of sidelined you for a, a large period of time. However... We also have the advantage that there's two of us in our yeah. business. So, you know, what I was left juggling while you were working on this secret project for that period of time, <laughs> other people listening to this won't have yeah. that other person. So, yeah, it's um, it, it definitely doesn't lessen the amount of work that you've got to do. Uh, another lesson learned, tip, advice from our prep. We mentioned before, close ticket sales at a, a set date before the event rather than just letting them run on up to the event. Yes, you might get a few more extra ticket sales um, if you keep things open uh, up to that point, up, up until the day before, but there's so much value in being able to move into prep mode with a complete clear plate where you're not thinking about yeah. sales. And as we said before, it makes it easier for you to then help people if they need to sell their tickets on because they're not competing with you. Yeah, so we did have a wait list in place for people that went to the sales page and wanted tickets. And so that meant that if somebody did have a ticket to sell, we could just email the wait list and say, hey, somebody's got this ticket. Yeah, definitely. So having closing ticket sales, we did it like two months beforehand. But this, the tickets have been on sale for like 10 or 11 months yeah, prior to that. Yeah, we've been selling for a long time. We've been selling them for a long, long time. That actually brings us to the next lesson. Uh, certainly that surprised us a little bit. People care far less about price of your ticket than you might think. So we assumed, we you again, you might have seen uh, our pricing approach with the, the tickets. It's similar to a lot of others. You start off with your super early bird discounted price then it's your early bird then it's you know you 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 gradually get to the full price we also offered a discount on the price to our members as well so you had the super early bird member price which was cheap then you had the super early bird public price which was a little more expensive so we had all those little increases as we went and we we kind of assumed that anyone who was going to come would buy their ticket when it's at its its cheapest and so when when it went on when it went up just to the regular price, we kind of figured, okay, well, we'll probably get some more sales, maybe, but... But that's essentially yeah, not that many. The bulk of the sales have already come in, and that was wrong. Yeah, so I, I was quite surprised. You know, we, we sold, I would say, the majority of our tickets in either the super early bird or the full price. Mm-hmm. The early bird, we didn't actually sell that me- many at all in yeah. comparison, which is why when we did put it up to the full price, and even with members, because we took away the member discount about a month before yeah. we closed sales, um, just to try and motivate people to buy those in. And even then, it, like, yeah, full price definitely sold yeah. more of that than any other ticket. And it, it mirrors what you often see with membership launches. You yeah. get a whole bunch of sales when you first make it available, then you get a whole bunch of sales at the at the end of the availability of a deal or a discount, you know, like, yeah. oh, if you're closing the doors to it. Um, and that's what happened. So we got a lot more sales before we closed ticket sales completely than than we thought we would because we thought, Listen, if you've if you've not bought the ticket when it was three fifty, you're not gonna buy when it's four fifty. Um or whatever it was. I can't even remember now. Four nine five. Four nine five. But they did. So that that kind of said to us that actually sorry, you're gonna say No, I was gonna say and it's worth it's you know, nothing about this event has been clearer to me than the the fact that you can't presume that other people act the way that same way you do. So mm. the whole thing with this, like as you get the idea from now, Mike and I are we think a lot about stuff, we plan stuff and things like that. And we so prepare that, in advance. <laughs> yeah, and the same comes for when we're attending events. We buy the tickets far in advance so we can plan our travel and things like that. So for us it just makes sense that if other people are coming to an event 
they're going to plan as far yeah. in advance, especially if they're coming from abroad. So, yeah, the fact that a lot of people left it till just two months before the event mm-hmm. was surprising to us and to me particularly because it's not how we personally yeah. approach events. Yeah, so I think in if doing this again, we would probably have a, a shorter period of time that the tickets would be on sale for or we'd at least know okay well we have a big push at the beginning and then we just generally have them available but there's no point in pushing real hard yeah. during that middle period which we were doing because we kind of figured that with every price increase the like like the amount of sales we would get would lessen and lessen and lessen and that just wasn't wasn't the case people care a lot less about the price than you might think we've even had we've had a lot of people who bought a full price um in the feedback that we've it done to charge more <laughs> yeah kind of saying you know considering how cheap the event was and we were like it was like 500 500 yeah. pounds so that was like what like seven seven eight hundred dollars maybe so it wasn't a cheap cheap event um certainly not for the size and the scale and the type of event it is um it's pretty much on par with others that are out there but Yeah, people care a lot less about price than you might think. Uh, The other lesson definitely from the prep is to not rely on other people to promote your event for you. So um, obviously with speakers, we we give them all the materials to let people know that they're involved with the event. Um, Some promoted it a little bit when when they were first announced because obviously it's a feather in their cap to be speaking at an event. Uh, Some made regular uh, references to it some put it into their social media scheduler and so they fire out a post every couple of weeks yeah and a shout out to amy and mark in particular amy there mark, because they were great at yeah, kind of publicizing it amy and mark publicizing it frequently um i think everyone at least mentioned once that they were doing it but even though you know we we kind of um we spoke to our speakers to to kind of say you know we neither arrange like an affiliate arrangement if you want to like encourage your audience to come to the event we'll give you a little bit of a a, a commission a thank you or we can give you a discount just for your audience uh because obviously a lot of these people have memberships and stuff um we did the same thing with a few kind of hand-picked communities where there was an overlap between our audience and and theirs and we had you know a lot of excited conversations with people who run their own communities who were kind of yeah definitely you know this event is perfect for my my guys um and we arranged kind of a special deal for their people and then i don't think they they even mention it to them yeah so that yeah. was a little disappointing. It was a little disappointing. Uh, less so, less so with the speakers. Yeah, um, especially because some of the speakers run their own events as exactly. well. So it's always going to be difficult. Yeah, we weren't expecting the speakers to go out there and be our salespeople. No. Um, because you know, some people who run events have the mindset that if someone's speaking on your stage, you're doing them a favor, and they should bend over backwards to show their appreciation, and they should put in all this time and effort and resources into promoting the event. We have the opposite mentality. If someone's speaking on our stage, they are doing us a favor because they are, (laughs) because they're putting in work. They are preparing talks. They're showing up. They are the talent and they're teaching your audience. And so, you know, we, we accounted for that. Um, But certainly with, I, I was definitely disappointed with some people where, they'd reached out to us in some cases to kind of say, listen, we, what can we do to, to spread the word? What can, we, what can we do to get more of our people at your event? And so we, we did stuff with them and they just didn't come through at all. Uh, so yeah, so definitely don't assume anyone else is going to promote your event for you. Uh, don't take it for granted that speakers or partners or or anything like anyone else other than you is going to um, be passionate enough about your event to promote it. So I think that's a good place to end. Those are our lessons from that build up, that prep period. And so at the end of part one of our little debrief, we are the weekend before Retain Live 2019. We are down. We are stressed. We are past our breaking point, we're burned out, and we just want to get this over and done with. And that is where we leave it. Next week, we're going to pick everything up again. If you've followed us on social, or obviously if you listen at the beginning, you know that it gets better. Okay, spoiler alert. <laughs> spoiler alert. It got a lot better. Um, the event was incredible. It went better than we could have 
ever yeah, imagined. Um, so next week we'll talk a little bit about what the turning point was and um, we'll walk through what happened on the setup day, what happened across the event, uh, and we'll give a little breakdown of how it all played out and talk about what comes next. But for now, we're going to hit pause. Hopefully you found this useful, entertaining, or uh, an interesting insight into the last eight or nine months of our lives in the build-up to this event. Join us next week. Same bad time, same bad channel, where Kali will be here with me as we continue our debrief from Retain Live 2019. We'll see you then. If you enjoyed this week's episode of the Membership Guys podcast, we invite you to check out membershipacademy.com. The Membership Academy is the essential resource for anyone at any stage of starting, growing, and running a membership website. Whether you're still trying to figure out what your idea is going to be, or whether your website is already up and running and you're just looking for ways to grow it and attract new members, then the Membership Academy can help you to get to the next level. With our extensive course library, monthly training, exclusive member-only discount perks and tools, and a supportive, active community to help you along the way with feedback, encouragement, and advice, the Membership Academy is the perfect place to be for anyone looking to start, manage, and grow a successful membership website. Check it out at membershipacademy.com.